boy, oh boy, do I have an episode for you today. I still almost can't believe (laughs) she decided to come on the podcast and talk to you guys. I have been following her for so many years. She puts the most incredible content out for us to consume. She is a leader in the pet food space. She is the biggest advocate and has been doing this work for so long. If you don't already know who I'm talking about, her name is Susan Thixton and she runs the blog Truth About Pet Food. I am just in awe of the dedication she has to all of our pets, not just hers, though it started out with her pets, but the dedication she has to all of our pets and us pet parents as consumers. She is the best and biggest consumer advocate in the pet food arena. And sometimes that's not the most incredible thing for her. She has had some really negative interactions with people in the pet food industry because of it, but she continues to put the information first, uncover and reveal the nasty truths about the pet food industry, regardless of what anyone has to say about it, because everything she does is to make our pets lives better and to provide us information to make educated and informed decisions for our pets. So without any further ado, let's get into today's episode with Susan Thixton. We are going to be talking about it all. We're going to be talking about some of the nasty, dirty things you may not want to know, but you need to know. And we're also going to talk a little bit about like what she has going on, what she actually does for you as a consumer advocate, and how you can help support her with little, like very, very little cost to you. And I think it is one of the most incredibly important things we can be doing. So, and you get something really, really cool for it as well. So let's get into today's episode with Susan Thixton and make sure to share this episode with any and everyone you know who has a pet, because this is information they need to know. Whether they want to know it or not, they need to know it to be able to make informed and educated decisions to best care for their pets. So let's get into today's episode, and I can't wait to hear the feedback you have on this one. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Well, Susan, thank you so much for joining me today on the Pet Parenting Reset. I have been wanting to have you on for so very long (laughs) because I feel like you were like, well, we know you are an incredible advocate for pet parents in the United States um, in regards to pet food. And your website, The Truth About Pet Food, uh, is a testament to that. But I just, I feel like you are just such an authority because of all of the research and knowledge you have on the topic of pet food. And this is like the most fundamental thing we can be doing. We can be improving in our pets' lives. So first of all, I want to say thank you for everything that you're doing and for being an advocate for pet parents and pets all across the country. Um, and if people aren't familiar with you, which I don't know why they wouldn't be, but just in case, <laughs> can you let them know a little bit about who you are and what you do? <laughs> well, I, I, you're exactly right. I'm a, a pet food consumer advocate. And that means that I argue with regulatory authorities um, on their lack of enforcement of law. That That is something that most pet owners don't realize. You think 
that the FDA has your back, is protecting your pet. And that is really not the case. They openly ignore laws. They call it selective enforcement. And, and these are significant. They hide regulations. Even manufacturers of pet foods have to purchase the regulations that they're governed by. They're not public information. So with human food, if you wanted to look up how they regulate chicken, as example, you know, you can read until your eyes are crossed all of the applicable laws. That is not the case in pet food. You have to purchase them from the Association of American Feed Control Officials. So it's all hidden and a lot of it is smoke and mirrors. You know, they, it looks, they show these images on labels of, of this beautiful roasted chicken when that's not what's inside the bag or can. So it, it's disheartening. It, it really is disheartening. And so I try to educate consumers to this. Uh, I try, I go to all the regulatory meetings and argue with them. <laughs> on, you know, more transparency for consumers. And in most cases, it goes in one ear and out the other with regulatory, but we keep trying. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much for doing what you're doing. And it it is just so eye-opening <laughs> to just read one blog on your website, but to like go into a rabbit hole and start really diving in is like, like you said, very disheartening. And just for everybody listening, I want you to know later on in the episode, we're going to talk a little bit about the list that Susan puts out. You're going to want to know about this. <laughs> but before we talk about that, uh, I, I have a couple of questions that are very much to kind of help people, the average pet parent in the U.S., kind of wrap their head around and understand a little bit better. Um, first and foremost, like, why do you do this? What? There's always something that happened, right? What happened to you <laughs> that, put, this, that set you down yeah. this rabbit hole? <laughs> this was many years ago, 30 years ago plus, um, my own pet died from a pet food. And my vet back then knew more about pet food then, 30 years ago, 30 plus years ago, than most veterinarians do today. Um, I take her in, she like overnight had a growth on her pelvic bone. Very, I mean, it came from nowhere. And I take her in and he said, it's bone cancer you have about two weeks to tell her goodbye. And, you know, in, in my shock and, and heartbreak, he said that the bone cancer was more than likely caused from her pet food, from a chemical preservative used in the pet food. That chemical preservative was ethoxyquin, which is still commonly used today. Um, and he said it was used to extend shelf life. Well, this was before the internet, before you could do all this research. So I made, I was so devastated, you know, something in the food that I bought and I trusted for her. Uh, and she was, you know, your soul dog, you, where you love them so much and you love all of them, but you have those special ones. But I truly think her purpose in life was for this to happen, to send me on this mission. I think she gave her life to help all of us save more lives. Anyway, so I called the pet food manufacturer. My vet said it was used to extend the shelf life. I didn't even really understand what shelf life was at the time, but I called the pet food manufacturer and I asked them how long the food would stay fresh. And they very proudly told me it would stay fresh for 25 years. 
And, and that just, that was it. I, you know, that moment losing my dog and then to know it had so much of this chemical preservative in it that it would stay fresh for 25 years. So this vet loaned me textbooks. And then when we had access to the internet, um, you can research anything. And I had a group of friends um, say, you know, you ought to start a website. And in 2006, I started Truth About Pet Food. That's a really incredible story. And honestly, I'm kind of blown away at the veterinarian you had back then. I wish we had more veterinarians. Yeah, like that now. (laughs) Um, That's incredible. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you've heard this so many times over the years, and it's been a long time, but it's always hard to think back on those pets we had. So thank you for sharing that story. Um, and I, you know, still give my condolences. It's, it's always hard. I understand that. Um, so you mentioned the, you mentioned AFCO, which you didn't say AFCO because people don't know what that is, but it's the, what, uh, American Association. Association of American Feed Control Feed. (laughs) And that's important. Feed control officials. It is a private organization whose members consist of State Department of Agriculture representatives and FDA. So its members are government officials, but this is not, this is a private organization and they write laws. So that's a little mind boggling right there that a private organization writes laws. Their laws are then adopted into state laws. Um, and um, they're, they're, they're adopted by reference. So AFCO publishes, I'm going to show you the book. <laughs> this is an older book. AFCO publishes, this is all the rules. You can see how big, how thick that book is. Um, and it's legal definitions of ingredients and so forth. And they sell this book. This book is not uh, unlike any other food, any other regulated product. All the laws are public information with pet food. It's not. You have to buy this book. It's published annually, and it's $120, 125 um, So, um, y- you know, that's an obstacle for veterinarians, you know, to understand the industry because they would have to buy the book. Plus, that's a very thick book and it's very detailed. Going to meetings, they hold two public meetings a year. It costs $500 just to walk in the door to attend the meeting. They're in different locations in the country. Um, The next one will be in August in Baltimore, Maryland. So for me, coming from Florida, I have to fly there. You have to get a hotel room. It's You're spending $1,500 to $2,000 twice a year just to go and, and watch these meetings and speak up when they allow you to, so forth, you know, to give comment on what they're discussing. But they they try, and they try very hard to block us out. You you know, they um, will not allow me to participate. They have working groups that industry is allowed to participate on, um, but they will not allow me to participate on representing consumers. Um, They tried one year to not let us attend at all, and we did get that turned around. But it it is a struggle for consumers to have a voice in this process. Um, But we keep we keep knocking on the door, whether they like it or not. We keep knocking on the door. And so it's it's something that you are continually fighting for, for consumers to have a voice in the process, as you just said. Um, And and I have a 
decent understanding of, of why. <laughs> um, but I think the average pet parent really has no idea. Like they, first of all, don't know that they don't have a voice. <laughs> and then they don't know why it's so important that they need to have a voice in this process. And I think because you've had a front row seat to this for so long, you are, um, you know, exceptionally qualified to talk about why it is so important consumers have a voice um, in in the regulatory process of pet feed, <laughs> which we'll talk about in just a few minutes as well. Um, so what are some of the things you've seen over the years that just like they're just not changed. I mean, with 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 the regulatory, I mean, you've already mentioned that like they they've tried very hard to to not let consumers have a voice. Why do you think that is? is like, what are they? They they just want to do things the way they want to do things, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely, and it's simpler for them. They also have industry. So if you if you the regulators, okay, they have industry pressuring them. We want you to do it our way. Um, and, and then they have consumer advocates pressuring and, and they, they bend to industry. They bend a lot to industry. They do not bend for consumers. They absolutely do not. And, and on your question of why it's so important. So, the feed and food thing. Pet food is called dog food, cat food. Okay, it says food right there on the label. They show images of food on the label. But 99%, 98% maybe, percent of all products are not food at all. They're feed, like cattle feed and chicken feed. They contain the same ingredients as cattle feed and chicken feed. They're regulated exactly the same as cattle feed and chicken feed, but they're called food. We have a, a, a pending request when you ask the FDA to change the way they do things. Um, it's a formal request called a citizen petition. And I've had this citizen petition in for at least a year if not longer, and they still haven't given me a response. Um, but I, I made a formal request that products that are not food do not abide by food laws. And there are some pet foods that do. They're, they're made in human food plants, contain human food ingredients. Um, but for the products that are not, that are feed grade, just like cattle feed and chicken feed, to call them dog feed and cat feed so that the consumer knows what they're buying. Feed grade, the FDA directly allows pet food manufacturers to source, and I'm quoting here, diseased animals and animals that have died other than by slaughter in pet food with no disclosure to the consumer whatsoever. So an animal that has died other than by slaughter, you can imagine these big farms, factory farms, and a lot of animals do perish just in the day-to-day -day operations. Those animals are not just buried or cremated. They, their carcasses are hauled into a truck, they might sit out in the sun for a few days, they're decomposing, they're ground and sold to pet food. And then the pet food uses this animal that has died other than by slaughter and puts a picture of a beautiful steak on the label. And that's wrong. That, that's, that's a misleading label that is misleading the consumer Consumers deserve to know if their pet's food contains animals that have died other than by slaughter, condemned animal material, so forth. So these are the things that we keep pushing for. I think 
if more people knew that, more people understood that, Certainly, if they saw a package that said food and another package that said feed, they would think twice. So yeah, it's, certainly, right. it's, it's certainly marketing and playing to what they know a consumer will not question, will not think twice about, um, because it, sa it says it's cat food. It says it's dog food. Um, I know... For me, one of the like most mind blowing things that that people say is like, I can't feed that to my dog or my cat because it's human food. And it's like, what in the world do you think dogs and cats are supposed to eat? Like, where where does their you think their food comes from outer space somewhere? <laughs> like, what's the difference? It might be safer if it came from outer space than feed grain. <laughs> 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 it, it drives me up the wall when people say that but that's i think such like it goes to show how deeply ingrained the marketing messages are uh on on humans like we're we just have been hearing the same things over and over and over for decades and decades and decades and now we think that dogs and cats are supposed to eat this food. We have no idea what it is, where it comes from. <laughs> and it's not the same thing we eat. Uh, no, so that's it's like not at all. Most of the, most pet foods contain ingredients that would be illegal to use in human food. And, and um, many products um, are labeled in a way, uh, it, misleading images as examples. So if you went to the grocery and bought a TV dinner and it had a picture of fried chicken on the label, if you open that TV dinner up and there was not fried chicken in that TV dinner, that's mislabeling. That product could be recalled. You know, you could end up suing that company for mislabeling and so forth. That's not the case in pet food. You know, they show grilled chicken. I've called these companies when they show grill marks. You know, they show a chicken breast with grill marks on it. So I've called them. Is the chicken in your food grilled? Well, no. Well, but you have an image of that on your label. Well, that's it's got chicken in it. You know, and no one holds them accountable. So they sort of have free reign to mislead consumers because no no one holds them accountable, even though there are regulations that state you can't have a misleading image on the label, nobody enforces it. So, you know, in some cases we have laws, but no one is enforcing them. You know, and in other cases, we don't have the laws. So it's it's a mess. People will often say, Oh yeah, human food's just as bad. No, <laughs> it, it, it's ten times, ten times worse in pet food. Yeah, I know you have a blog on your website, and I will make sure to put the link in the show notes. I often refer to it um, when I'm talking about the the marketing practices of of pet food companies because you kind of break down everything on the front of the bag and everything on the back of the bag what is required and what is marketing and all of the images like you've been talking about it's all marketing a lot of the verbiage is marketing and not highly regulated um, something yeah. can say natural and it's not there's what what is natural about what is in that bag, right? So there's a lot of marketing on the labels, um, and you have uh, I know one blog in particular that I'm always referencing um, that I think does an incredible job of like j breaking down what is on that pet food bag or can that is actually regulated, and it is very minuscule compared to what is on that bag of food. Um, so I will make sure to put that in the show notes so everybody can go back and, and, and check that out because it's it's very, very little <laughs> that's actually regulated. Um, I know I looked at a, a bag of food the other day and it had all this beautiful chicken and it was white meat and dark meat chicken. You could, you know, discern and spinach. And I was like, 
okay, that looks, that looks great. Right. And I looked at the ingredient label and spinach was not only below salt, but like way below salt. <laughs> um, which, uh, is another thing that, um, I know Rodney Habib talks about a lot is the salt divide. Um, so when people are looking at the ingredient label, maybe you can, in, uh, tell people a little bit about how to discern, uh, an ingredient label, but it goes from like highest, uh, percentage to lowest. And that salt that divide is pre, pre cooking weight. Yeah. Pre cooking, cooking weight, weight, heaviest to lightest. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, but like, as example, chicken. Okay. So we see that word chicken on the label and our minds are going to what we see in the grocery store for chicken. Every single ingredient in pet food products have their own separate definition. It's not the same definition as in human food. Pet food chicken can be the meat. It can be meat and bones. It can be skin meat and bones. Or it can be just bones or just skin. So chicken might be just chicken bones. Like if they mechanically separate the meat from, from the skeletal carcass, What's left, it's referenced as frames, poultry frames, that can be all that's in that pet food. And, and, and we're not told that. We're thinking meat. Mm -hmm. um, so every single ingredient has a very unique definition, unique to human food. Pet food chicken also is not required to be USDA inspected and passed. Human food chicken is required to be inspected by the USDA and passed as human edible. So when you see a pet food that the label, ignore the website, nobody scrutinizes websites, and there's a lot of websites that, shall I say, lie to consumers. Um, but if the label of the pet food says human grade, then that means every ingredient in that food is human edible per human food laws, and that the food was manufactured for all the safety standards of human food. Those pet foods are more expensive, but if you can imagine condemned chicken allowed in pet food, the chicken frames, which is not edible for humans. Maybe you'll make bone broth out of the chicken frames. Um, but um, so it's, it's more waste material, leftover material in a feed grade product. Um, it's, that's a lot cheaper. Plus manufacturing conditions. Uh, pet food manufacturers are not required to transport ingredients under refrigeration. And in fact, like all the, you'll see chicken meal, um, pork meal, that meal name means the ingredient was cooked, processed, um, and, and cooked prior to manufacturing of the pet food. And it looks like a dry powder. It looks like dirt. Chicken meal, any kind of meat meal looks, it's just a, a, a brown powder. So that's traveled, they, they deliver that in dump trucks to pet food manufacturers, and it's stored in silos. So it, the, the cost of manufacturing in a feed-grade facility with these ingredients that do not require refrigeration is a lot less expensive than fresh meat that has to be shipped under refrigeration, that has to be stored under refrigeration, the costs are then much more understandable when you you know the differences between the two. And earlier, and since we're talking about quality of ingredients, you mentioned um, you know diseased animals and animals that died other than by slaughter. Um, another term people 
toss around frequently that I think most people are not familiar with is 4D meets. So um, you've kind of t touched on it a little bit, but can you can you tell people a little bit more specifically about exactly what 4D meets are and why why we talk about them so much? <laughs> 4D stands for dead, disease, dying, and disabled. Um, 4D is, is more, uh, meat is regulated by the USDA. Any food product except pet food that contains more than 3% meat is regulated by the USDA. Um, so say uh, uh, a, a pizza, a cheese pizza, is regulated by FDA, but a pizza with pepperoni and sausage, you know, with with three percent meat on it, that would be regulated by USDA. USDA is who classifies these. They are also in charge of all slaughtering facilities. FDA USDA is on site in these facilities, um, so. Um, USDA is who classifies the dead, diseased, dying, and disabled, and those are condemned animals. They are rejected for use in human food, but they are open with a, welcomed in pet food with open arms. It's it's horrible, and and up the ante of horrible is that consumers are not told. These materials, and I'm talking billions with a B, billions of pounds every year of this condemned material, animal material, is disposed of. It's a method of disposal is all it is, um, pet food, but that we're paying for. Um, billions of pounds every year goes into pet food. It's not, oh, that doesn't happen very often. Yeah, it happens a lot. It sounds to me like the many arms of regulatory bodies uh, over, over whether it is the finalized pet food product or ingredients that go into pet food, um, would rather just not not inform the consumer because then the consumer might actually make a decision to buy a product that is not convenient for these regulatory bodies. It, and, and so if it's billions of pounds, if you look at it from a waste disposal aspect, looking at it from their perspective, this material, especially if it's diseased animals, um, this material cannot be landfilled because then it could pollute and contaminate waterways. It could pollute the soil. It could make any animals sick in the area. <clears throat> so they do have to dispose of this material somewhere. I, I get that part of it. The part I have a problem with is disposing of it in a, a, a consumable product, a pet consumable product, with no disclosure to the consumer. That's that's the the horrible part. Yeah, and you know, it almost seems like they're. It almost seems like kind of push pushing off their own responsibility because in my mind, number one, you know, I, we, we should be doing better with raising these animals in the first place. Like I'm not a fan of factory farming, right? Like that's me. But also when we think about, okay, if we can't put these diseased animals in the ground, if we can't dispose of them in that way in a landfill, but then we put them in a consumable product, as you were just saying to where our dogs and our cats are eating them, well, what's happening to our dogs and our cats when they pass away? I mean, ultimately, they're, for the most part, winding up right back in the ground, right? So it's still, that's still winding up back in the ground somehow. Maybe not in a concentrated form in a landfill, but um, 
if that's what they're eating and that that is ultimately potentially uh, making our pets very, very sick as well, um, that's it's still going back into the ground. I don't know. It just doesn't make sense to me. But it, <laughs> maybe it's it a makes sense ticking time bomb, I think. I, I really do believe it is a ticking time bomb because just think when animals poop. So if it's a diseased animal processed, um, and, and it depends on the state, but as example, like when these turkey farms or poultry chicken farms have um, avian flu and the, the whole population, the whole barn has to be euthanized, some states will allow those sick animals to be processed into pet food. So what if this gets carried on and what if it goes into pet food and somehow that, that bacteria or virus or whatever survives the process, it survives and comes out the other end of your dog and lands in a park, lands, you know, in your backyard and when you pick it up, you get sick. It, it is, it's a ticking time bomb. I, I don't know all the possibilities of what could happen, but it mm -hmm. makes sense to me that a lot of bad things could be happening from this. Plus you see on the internet all the time, and I've written the FDA about this, um, people will eat their pet's food. Kids, little kids picking up the pet food and eating it. Oh my goodness. You, you know, and there, there, there are from some of the, there was a survey done where I think two of 10 people, um, pet owners, two of 10 pet owners admitted they have tasted their dog or cat's food. Well, if that food contains diseased animals or animals that have died other than by slaughter, that's extremely dangerous for that that human to be eating that, you know, and, and FDA ignores it. You know, to me, there should be warnings on that label that absolutely do not consume this, but. Yeah. But also those warnings. Yeah. If they were to put those warnings on the bags, then again, it might make a, a consumer who is trying to do their due diligence and actually reading the package, it might make them raise an eyebrow and ask some questions, right? Yeah. yeah. And, if, yeah. and if consumers ask too many questions, then their whole scheme of waste disposal, you know, gets a hitch in it. Then we get a problem. What are we going to do with all of this billions of pounds? And this is just, animal products, you know, the same holds true for everything else down, you know, all the rest of the ingredients as well, too. Yeah. So another topic that you write on extensively are pet food recalls. And one in particular that I think is very intentionally blown out of proportion are salmonella recalls because when they're blown out of proportion, it's usually with a fresh food company, probably a raw food company. But what I notice when I look at the information that you provide to consumer pet parents that you're getting directly from like the FDA website and passing along is that these dry food highly processed rendered kibbles on you know that are in a bag on a shelf in a grocery store or a pet store have significant as, as far as like volume of product recalled significantly more salmonella recalls am i getting that correct you are yeah i the um fda has they're called enforcement reports and if you search the FDA enforcement reports, you can look up any recall in the enforcement reports. 
And almost all of them, some of them, they leave off this information, but they will discuss how many pounds of, of pet food. So as example, Midwestern pet food, a dry pet food, had a salmonella recall two years ago, a year and a half ago, and, and it was over 6 million pounds of, of pet food recall, recalled in, in that one recall. Uh, as compared to a raw pet food, which are smaller manufacturers, um, they might have 20,000 pounds, 50,000 pounds, you know, and, and, and that's a lot, um, but that would be the max. So I went through as far back as FDA records had, and, and this was several years ago I did this, it took me two weeks to go through all the recalls as far back as, as FDA records had. And I uh, got the pounds and the cause of each recall from the enforcement report. And I put it in a big spreadsheet. And then I added up all the dry foods, all the wet foods, the, you know, like canned foods, all the raw, so forth. Um, and for pathogenic bacteria recalls alone, and I think this is from 2018 to, to through 2022. So this is a time frame when FDA was heavily scrutinizing raw pet foods. Uh, in that time period, 84% of, of pounds recalled for pathogenic bacteria were for, um, were for kibble. And only 14%, 15% were for draft, uh, were for raw foods. So that's a pretty big <laughs> difference. <laughs> yeah. What I think the average consumer thinks in their head uh, about salmonella or pathogen, as you pathogenic uh, bacteria recalls. So, and in in my mind, even these pathogenic bacteria recalls, um, while, yeah, we might want to have some level of concern for our pet, they're much more adept at being able to handle and, and not really get sick from these things. It's it's the potential for humans to get sick that, that we're more concerned with. Is that also correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Pets can handle it. Now, it, it, you know, an immune compromised pet Maybe not, um, right. and and the real, but I I believe that the FDA's major concern is human illness, um, not pet illness. But to date, there have been only two human illnesses linked to raw pet food. There have been forty nine human il illnesses linked to kibble pet food, pathogenic bacteria. Yeah. So, Interesting. and the FDA has warnings, even with this, even when significantly more pounds of pet food, of dry pet food have been recalled for pathogenic bacteria, significantly more human illnesses have been linked to a dry pet food. The FDA website only contains warnings for raw pet food. There are no warnings for the risk of pathogenic bacteria to dry food. A certain Very bias. interesting. The, yeah. Oh, for sure. Uh, and do you think that's because raw pet foods are not participating in this waste disposal <laughs> system that they have going on? Well, some of them do, actually. You know, that that, yeah. that is something that, I uh, hear from pet owners and they'll go, oh, I'm good. I feed raw. Well, there are mm -hmm. bad raw manufacturers out there too that use animals that have died other than by slaughter in a raw pet food. Um, and, and that's not good. Um, it's not good yeah. in any style of pet food. So don't assume that just because it's raw, you're safe. Um, I think the FDA's bias against raw is old school. 
you know, pet food is supposed to be these little brown balls, or it's supposed to be in a can. This is this new wave, you bunch of hippies feeding your, your pets raw pet food. I, I just don't think they can wrap their brains around it. Uh, I, I just think they're old school. And um, I do think the raw pet food industry, um, smaller manufacturers are intimidated by FDA. FDA can be very intimidating if you're a manufacturer because they can come into your plant and shut you down if, if they choose or cause you massive headaches. So smaller manufacturers, raw cooked regardless, tend to try to fly under the radar. They, they, they don't want to address things with FDA. And I would like to see them get together and go to DC and sit down with FDA and, you know, give FDA an education on what safety procedures they use and spend some time educating regulatory authorities of what this product is and the benefits it is to pets and so forth. I, I, I wish they would do that, but I understand their intimidation at the same time, because, you know, if, if, you show you, it's a game of poker in a, in a lot of cases, and if you show show your hand too early, you could be in big trouble. Yeah, that that is a very interesting um, out, outlook for sure, and I I see where you're coming from, and that sounds like a really awesome thing <laughs> to want to have happen as well, um, because feeding our for me feeding our pets a whole fresh food diet is, you know, or as much as we can feed them whole fresh foods in combination with, you know, depending on what we can afford, um, it is, is certainly the way we want to move forward. But I'm glad you brought up that not all raw foods are created equal because <laughs> they're not right. Um, and so that kind of brings me into uh, I, I want to ask you about your list, but I want to tell a quick story really quickly <laughs> before I, I, we talk about your list. Um, I put up a reel, a TikTok a few months back, and I didn't think much of it. I walked into a Target, and I hadn't been in a Target in years. I don't, I just, it's not, I don't tend to shop at um, those big, big box stores like that. And I walked down the pet food aisle and I was like, oh my gosh, what is that? Like literally, I was just like blown away. Like, what is this? What is going on here? And so I did, I just took video of all the different pet foods and I, I had put um, some music over it about, it, it was a song about how much you lie, right? <laughs> and it was, you know, my caption was, basically just talking about, you know, there's, there's more out there than just this and this stuff, th these companies are really lying a lot to you with their marketing. And I got one comment that really stood out to me and she was like, I don't understand. You're telling me that everything out there that's available for me to feed my dog is not good. And it really made me think there are so many people out there who literally don't know that there is a whole world outside of what's available on the grocery store shelf. And so I want, I, I was hoping you would tell people a little bit about the list that you put out every year, because these are going to be companies that are putting out really amazing foods for our pets in comparison to what people are finding on say their grocery store shelves. Well, uh, and and for pet owners' understanding, before we get to the list, a, a pet owner years ago, um, I wrote an article on something, and I think it was with the diseased animals and non-slaughtered animals. And she she sent me an email, and she went, "No, that that can't be true. Absolutely, it cannot be true." And I went, "Well, yeah, there's the links. It's in the article. Did you click on the links and read that?" And she wrote me back. Yes, I did, but I don't believe it. it. It's just not true. And this went back and forth and back and forth. And finally, I went, look, 
you know, if, if you don't want to believe it, that's fine. You know, uh, the best I can tell you is that, yes, this is accurate. This is truthful. And about a month or two later, she sends me an email and she said, you know, Susan, you were wanting me, it's like an onion, and you were wanting me to get to the very middle of the onion when all I could do is take off one layer and then sit and, and absorb that and, and accept that much. And then I could take off another layer and another layer. So when we're talking to other pet owners and we see them buy some feed grade horrible product, and we might go up to them and say, do you know that's bad? Well, that that it's hard for them to accept because we're wanting them to get all the way to the middle of the onion just like that immediately. And they might mm -hmm. not be able to. So we have to just give it in, in little doses. So with the list, each year um, I publish a list of pet foods that I would trust to give my own pets. I am 100% consumer supported. I would not be doing this work. I wouldn't be able to go to AFCO meetings. I wouldn't be able to have the website, nothing. I wouldn't have a roof over my head without consumers. Uh, I take no money from pet food manufacturers. I won't even ever let them buy me lunch, okay? Um, so, I have to have something to keep a roof over my head and do this. And the number one question everybody asks me, just tell me what to feed. Just tell me, you know, I, I can't do all this research and it's mind boggling. So just tell me, or they'd ask me what I feed my own pets and I cannot make brand recommendations. I can't endorse or condemn any brand. So I came up with a list and this is, a list of foods that I would trust to feed my own pets. It's not a recommendation. It's just foods that I have thoroughly scrutinized. We start off with a long list of questions and with their answers, like if they say one of the questions is, are ingredients human grade, human edible? And if they say yes, then I go, okay, prove it. Send me verification documents for every human grade ingredient, send me verification documents. And they have to verify every claim. Um, if the meats are humanely raised, sourced from animals who were humanely raised, I need the verification on that. If they're organic, I need the verification on that. It's a very, very detailed process. It takes me about three months to get through all of this every year. And that gets published you know, each new year gets published on December 1st. I'm right now working, pet owners have asked me, and and it's, you know, I'm, I'm torn. I'm glad I'm doing it, but I'm torn because it's so much, so many hours invested in it, but I'm doing a treat list because pet owners have asked, oh, please, I need treats and will you do it? And so that should be out. I'm hoping maybe by June 1st. So we'll see, but um, I've been working on that for several weeks now, but we got a long ways to go. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's incredible. Um, I'm glad to hear that. Not, I, obviously you have a lot of work <laughs> to put into it, um, but it'll also help, help you to continue to do what you're doing um, and also provide people with information that they are really like, they're really struggling to get on their own. Yeah. Um, because you and know, it's you verified. Have... You know, that's the part that I think really, and I didn't initially start off verifying their claims. And a few years in, you know, as I'm learning more, I went, okay, we're going to, everybody has to verify, provide. And sometimes I have to sign non disclosure agreements. And that's fine. I'll sign it. Nobody sees the documents but myself. And um, it's amazing. Even though it's a lot of work, it's so amazing with some of these companies. I mean, they'll send me all these documents and you're looking through 
these wonderful, healthy, high quality ingredients. And, and that's just, that's so cool to see the efforts that some companies go through for their ingredients. That's, that's really neat. So we're not to that point yet on the treat list, but we will be soon. And that's, that's very rewarding when when you see these high quality products out there. Oh, for sure. And and another reason that I'm I'm really glad that the the list exists is because you know, even if you do the you do try to put in the work on your own and and figure out all of the things that you would prefer for your pet to be eating. It, it, and it is a lot of work. I am, I also like to have like rotation and not to feed the same thing all the time. So having multiple companies, multiple brands, multiple, and, and not just in, um, raw food, but also cooked food. And I think you also have a couple, you know, some, um, dry food companies as well that are really, really trying to do the very best they can in that that medium of still providing you yeah. know dry food product to to consumers um so thank you so much for doing that and uh, giving people options for their pets and and to be able to to rotate and not feed their pets the same thing over and over yeah. again as well <laughs> yeah yeah it, well and, and i do the same thing we uh we feed part commercial and part home prepared and the commercial is both cooked and raw, and the home prepared is cooked. I'm not so much a stickler on any one particular style of pet food, but I, I, it has to be human grade. The, the food ingredients have to be human grade. Yeah, uh, I completely understand that, and, and I think that is definitely the gold standard as well. Um, what I, I hope, I hope the listeners, uh, of the podcast know that that's, that's the gold standard and that's what we we are hoping for to get the highest quality foods in our pets, um, to give them the best quality of life and not just lifespan, but health span we're talking about now too, right? Yeah. The actual amount of time that they are healthy in their lives. Um, well, and you're and also what... by, by supporting those companies that are doing it right, you know, by purchasing their foods, you are, you're supporting the good guys, you, you know, and even if you can't afford to feed a hundred percent, say human grade and humanely raised, feed some because again, and, and, and don't buy it online unless you're buying it directly from the manufacturer. Manufacturer, find a local independent pet food store and support your local economy by purchasing from somebody in your area. A lot of small independent pet food stores, they know so much about the products that they sell. You can ask the store, you know, how do you select the products that you sell? And listen to the response on that. And if you like it, then support that business. If you don't like it, go to another one. Um, but many of these small company or small pet stores, they know every detail about the products that they carry. And that's wonderful. That's backup for you. You know, the on, big online retailers are not going to have your back should a problem occur. That small independent pet food store will. So I'm I'm a big believer in supporting businesses that that do the right thing. Yeah, that's a good I think good place to leave off. Support local, support small business, support the ones that are trying their darndest to get it right. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. you and your pets. So. Susan, thank you so very much for your time and your wisdom and everything you're doing to be advocates for pets and, and pet parents in the U.S. Where can people, I know we've, we've talked, I know I've said it, but where can people find out more about you and learn more about what you do and um, the 
feed that is on the shelves that they're feeding their pets? Well, the website is truthaboutpetfood.com. Uh, we also have our consumer association, which most of the content is all on truth about pet food, but our consumer association is association for truth in pet food. Um, so that helps if consumers join the association, it's $10 a year. The, the membership into the association helps get me to regulatory meetings. Um, so, you know, whatever that, that helps. Um, but all, the most of the, in the newsletter on truth about pet food is free. You can, I think the link is at the top of the page. Just click on that link and subscribe to the newsletter. I send out recall notices, any notices from FDA, educational articles, so forth. They're all sent out through the newsletter. Awesome. So check out truthaboutpetfood.com and the consumer association that she has, because we definitely want to keep Susan going to these regulatory meetings. She is often the only or one of very, very, very few handful of people there who are um, consumer advocates. And we uh, are so thankful that that you are our voice at these regulatory meetings. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside.